me to welcome our students and our faculty here this evening, and to also welcome Sister Jane Garrity, the president of Salve Regina University, and so many of her students, faculty, and guests. Welcome all to Spruance Auditorium. Tonight it is our great good fortune to hear from a world-renowned scholar, a New York Times best-selling author, a brave soldier, and a skilled diplomat, Ambassador Michael B. Oren. <laughs> This evening's event is made possible by the leadership of Salve Regina's Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy. I would also like to acknowledge the support of Rhode Island's senior U.S. Senator Jack Reed, who always demonstrates a deep interest in educating our nations and the world's future leaders. In fact, when we bring our international students to Washington every spring, he personally comes down to the steps of the Capitol to show officers from 61 nations of the world how the U.S. government works, how it tries to work. And uh, those, uh, <laughs> it works best. Uh, but those leaders go on to lead their navies and their militaries. And uh, we learned firsthand this year how important that is as the leaders of Egypt's army, many of whom graduated from this institution and others, were reminded about what they learned when they were here in Newport, about how American military treats its people. And so we hope that continues. We really appreciate Senator Reid's support. It's just wonderful how the two schools have come together to bring Ambassador Orrin to Newport. I would like to now invite to the podium Dr. James Lutis the executive director of the Pell Center, who will introduce our distinguished guest speaker. Thank you, Admiral. Admiral Christensen, Ambassador Peters, distinguished guests. Admiral, uh, you were extremely gracious in uh, breaking with tradition tonight and granting me the privilege of, of introducing the speaker. I suppose it's a little bit like painting the visiting team's name in the end zone of a football stadium, but whatever the metaphor, we thank you for the kindness. I'd like to add too, sir, what a pleasure it's been to work with your terrific team in organizing tonight's lecture. We hope that this is the first of many future collaborations between the Pell Center and the Naval War College. Ladies and gentlemen, Tonight's speaker faces challenges that are well known to everyone in this hall. We meet at a time of profound change in the Middle East. In the course of 2011, regimes have fallen in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt. In Syria, the government has turned its guns on its own citizens, while discontent simmers across the entire region. At the same time, the Palestinian Authority has initiated the process to seek statehood through the United Nations Security Council, not across the negotiating table. And we note with growing concern the nuclear pursuits of the Iranian regime. It is, to borrow a phrase, a dangerous neighborhood, and its complexities are immense. While his government navigates these issues, the Israeli ambassador in Washington faces other challenges as well. In the United States, the public is most focused on the economic malaise that has settled across the country, producing joblessness, political movements that dominate the evening news, and a fiscal reckoning that promises a reordering of America's priorities. To be sure, the debt debate in this country has rekindled questions about America's role in the world and the investment we make in our defense and in our foreign aid. There are some who believe America should come home, there are others who believe that we should re-examine our relationships with our closest allies, even those who would challenge the value of the U.S.-Israel security relationship. This is the environment, the context in which tonight's speaker works every day. It is a daunting set of challenges, and so it is no surprise that the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu would select someone whose service to Israel is only matched by his personal knowledge of the United States, a son of New Jersey who found his home in Israel, Michael Oren is an acclaimed author, a soldier, a gifted scholar of the Middle East, and a skilled diplomat. We are fortunate and grateful that he is able to share his thoughts with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Michael Oren, Ambassador of Israel to the United States. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jim. That's good. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Jim, thank you. There's one challenge I don't have to deal with tonight that I usually have to deal with. I have never before walked into an audience, academic or otherwise, where everybody went quiet like that. That was very impressive. I must be at the US Naval War College. That is terrific. So Jim, thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Christensen. Thank you, Sister Jane Garrity. Thank you, students, faculty. Thank you for my wife, Sally, for accompanying me this evening. Um, thank you all for coming out. Now, as you know, you heard that I'm, as a background, I'm, I'm an historian by training. And as historians, we, we're always taught that we should always watch out for reductivism. All right, we should always be careful not to ascribe great events in history to simple and single causes. So I'm going to beg your forgiveness tonight while I open my remarks by saying that the state of Israel exists today in no small measure thanks to a single decision by one man by the name of Woodrow Wilson and an action by the U.S. Navy. That really got him quiet. All right. World War I was raging, 1915, and not only in Europe, but also in the Middle East. And caught in the middle of this fighting was the small but vibrant Jewish community in Palestine, the land of Israel. And those Jews who were in the land of Israel at the time hoped to someday establish an independent Jewish state there. But the war threatened to smash that dream. It threatened to destroy uh, the economy, of this inchoate Jewish state, and it threatened the lives of the leaders of that community. And the situation there in 1915 seemed particularly hopeless. But then in step Woodrow Wilson. And I don't know how many of you know this, but Woodrow Wilson was the grandson and son and nephew of Presbyterian ministers. And he had been raised from the earliest age to uphold the Jewish right and quest for independence in their ancient homeland. And hearing of the plight of the Jews of the Holy Land, Wilson decided to dispatch several U.S. Navy destroyers to the newly created port of Tel Aviv and Jaffa. And there they did two things. They crammed their decks with the leaders of this Jewish community to evacuate them to safety. And then they filled the hulls of these ships with the products of the Jewish community, Jaffa oranges and Carmel wines. No kidding. In one stroke, Woodrow Wilson saved the fledgling Jewish economy, and he gave shelter to Jewish refugees. Among those refugees was a young labor leader by the name of David Ben-Gurion. Spent the next year in New York at the New York Public Library reading up on American democracy. And in 1948, he became Israel's first prime minister. He would not have done that. He would not have made it had it not been for Woodrow Wilson and the US Navy. Now, 60 years later, in 2008, in honor of Israel's Independence Day, the U.S. Navy flew me uh, out to the USS Truman, which was patrolling the Eastern Mediterranean, a great aircraft carrier. Now, many people in this audience maybe have been on aircraft carriers. Admiral, no doubt you have been. But nobody told me that I'd be going from 180 miles an hour to zero in 0.7 seconds. Okay, nobody told me this. Okay? So we're landing, and I'm here. My eyeballs are somewhere out there. I was convinced we had crashed. It was an extraordinary experience, one of the great experiences of my life. I walked out onto this city in the middle of the Eastern Mediterranean, 5,200 crew members and officers on this. And I was, had this inestimable privilege of lecturing to this crew about the history of the US-Israel alliance. And I told them, and as I'll tell you this evening, that relationship, that friendship, is the most multifaceted and deepest alliance which this country, the United States of America, has had with any foreign power in the post-World War II history. Now, I was an historian back then, and uh, I thought I knew a lot about that history. Uh, and then, two and a half years ago, I became Israel's ambassador to Washington. And it was a very humbling experience, because I found out and forgive me, you in the Navy, for this uh, cliche, I forgot that what I knew was actually a drop in the ocean. Now, any true alliance is based most fundamentally on shared values and beliefs. And the roots of the US-Israel relationship go 
far back. They go much further back than 1948, Israel's creation. They go back actually hundreds of years to, to the day that uh, uh, a pair of buckled shoes uh, landed on a certain rock on the Massachusetts shore not too far from here. Uh, those buckled shoes, of course, belonged to the Puritan pilgrims, and the pilgrims had suffered terribly at the hands of the Church of England, and they looked into their Bible to find a biblical model uh, to help them deal with their suffering, and they decided that the, what they called the Old Testament provided that model. And they started calling themselves the New Israel, the New Jews, and they gave Hebrew names to their sons and daughters, you know, the Benjamins and the Isaacs and the Sarahs and the, the Rebeccas. They made Hebrew a required language at all of their universities. Um, one of my former students from Yale here, Yale has Hebrew in its uh, logo, you know, um, and uh, really a required language. James Madison was a Hebrew major at Princeton, and he failed. He had to spend an extra year there. Uh, at the conclusion of the American Revolution, there was a big debate in 1783 whether it was gonna, what was going to be the great seal of the United States of America. And there were some American leaders who thought it should be this bald eagle. Uh, but other American leaders said no, that the, the seal of the newly created United States should be Moses leading the children of Israel out of bondage. Uh, into, out, of, out of bondage into freedom. And there was actually a heated debate in Congress over what was going to be the, the seal of the United States. Um, Moses lost out, uh, we, but came this close to having that. So you got the, uh, the um, follically challenged eagle instead. Um, but uh, you should know that the designers of the Moses seal were no, uh, none other than Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. So the identity of the founding fathers generation with the biblical narrative was very, very deep. And many of these founding fathers and mothers had concluded that to be good Christians, to be good Americans, it was their divinely ordained duty to help the old Jews get back to their promised land, uh, the land of Israel. And so you had a gentleman by the name of John Adams, the second president of the United States, who said it was his fondest dream that 100,000 Jewish soldiers would march back into Judea and reclaim it as a Jewish kingdom. That Abraham Lincoln in 1863, uh, pledging to help realize the recreation of a Jewish state once he had concluded the great civil war and reunited the, the states. Um, I mentioned Woodrow Wilson and Harry Truman. Harry Truman, who... Uh, made the United States on May 14, 1948, the first nation on earth to recognize the recreated Jewish state exactly 11 minutes after we declared our, uh, our independence. And if you go to the USS Truman, there is actually an exhibit um, immortalizing and testifying to that great event. Now, Israel came into being in May 1948 not just as a Jewish state, it came into being as the Middle East's only functioning democracy. And the fact that Israelis cherish the same values, free speech and free assembly, respect for individual rights and independent judiciary, those same values that are cherished by the United States, by the American people, created another level of affinity between Americans and Israel. President John F. Kennedy, said Israel, and I quote, carries the shield of democracy and honors the sword of freedom. And President Bill Clinton likened Israel to, an Amer to America, quote, an oasis of liberty, a home to the oppressed and the persecuted. In a region in which homosexuality is widely deemed a capital offense, Israel has hosted the International Gay Pride Day. Um, in fact, we actually give shelter to Palestinian gays who are threatened with execution. And in contrast to other Middle Eastern states where Middle Eastern leaders sometimes can hold themselves above the law, not so long ago, a couple of months ago, a former president of Israel was convicted of sexually offenses, sexual offenses by a board of three judges. Two women and an Arab judge sentenced the former president of Israel to prison. Now, Israel belongs to a very, very small club of countries in the world. Today, Israel at 63 and a half years old as a democracy is older than half of the democracies in the world. But beyond that, we're part of this very small club of countries, America's there, Canada is there, that has never known a second of non-democratic rule. We've never had a military coup, we've never had a threatened military coup. Think about it. Very few countries in the world can make that claim. And these facts are intrinsically valued by Americans. And that appreciation is reciprocated 
by the people of Israel. There are streets in the United States named for David Ben-Gurion, streets named for Golda Meir. If you go to our hometown in Jerusalem, you will find Washington and Lincoln streets in downtown Jerusalem. Alone in the Middle East, Israel holds, hosts memorials for John F. Kennedy, for Martin Luther King, and for 9-11. There's a big 9-11 uh, memorial just outside of Jerusalem. Israel is the only state in the Middle East with a park, it's right down the road from our house, a park uh, that is named for and contains an exact replica of the Liberty Bell. Now from the Korean conflict and throughout the Cold War, Israel also backed the United States. If you look at our voting record in international forums, look at our voting record in the UN, you'll find that we always vote together. About two, three days ago, there was a vote in the General Assembly on the boycott of the blockade of Cuba. I don't know if you saw that. 100, 183 countries voted uh, in favor of lifting it. Two countries voted against it. The United States and Israel stood together. So we had this strong spiritual connection. We had a strong connection with democracy and values. We had a strong um, global vision that we shared. But we did not have a strategic relationship. 1967, Israel fought a fateful war, the Six-Day War. We fought that war with French arms, not with American arms. But it was on the so-called seventh day of that conflict when American policymakers in Washington woke up and said, whoa, there's this powerhouse in the Middle East that defeated, just defeated several Soviet-backed armies. We should be aligned with that state. And thus was born the U.S.-Israel Strategic Alliance. Today, the United States provides Israel with roughly $3 billion annually in military aid. Um, for a sort of a comparison which may resonate with some of you, that's about the cost of one half of one new Zumwalt class destroyer. Now, three quarters of that money is spent here in the United States, providing immense support for the American defense industry. But beyond that, it's fair to ask the question, what does the United States get in return for that aid? Well, here's the answer. Together, the United States and Israel have developed the most advanced anti-ballistic systems in the world. It's a multi-layered system covering everything from short-range rockets to intercontinental and either, even, even orbital uh, rockets. And recently, the lowest stratum of that system, the Iron Dome system, um, which was completed within three years on a shoestring budget, proved to be the first anti-ballistic system that uh, succeeded in combat situation. We took down several salvos of Soviet for Russian-made Grad missiles that were fired by Hamas out of Gaza, fired at our southern cities of Ashdod and Beersheba. They work. They work. 85% success rate. We should get them up to about 95% rate soon. The U.S. prepositions uh, military supplies in Israel, about $800 million worth of those supplies, medical equipment in Israel, American troops, Trained with their Israeli Defense Forces counterparts in missile defense, in aerial combat, and especially in special operations. And it's no coincidence that uh, Admiral William McRaven, who commanded that extraordinary raid against Osama bin Laden, had worked extensively with Israeli special forces. Ships of the Sixth Fleet pay regular ports of call visits at Haifa. American military planes land at our airfields. In the Negev Desert, 62% of our country is the Negev Desert. There is a base, and in that base there are 100 American soldiers, the first American soldiers to be stationed permanently on Israeli soil. They are operating the X-Ban radar station, which will be capable of warning friendly states throughout the region of incoming Iranian missiles. Israeli armament protects Bradley and Stryker units from rocket-propelled grenades, while above them Israeli-made drone aircraft pinpoint, to pinpoint targets for them. Can't go too deeply into this next line, but listen carefully. All U.S. fighter aircraft, fixed wing and helicopters, incorporate Israeli concepts and components, as do modern class U.S. warships. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, shares with the U.S. Mil military its extensive knowledge in um, detecting and neutralizing improvised de explosive devices. They are the largest cause of American military casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have a great amount of experience with IEDs in detecting them and neutralizing them. And in the intelligence field, the cooperation is especially vast. Israeli and American intelligence agencies 
continually exchange information, analyses, operational experience in counterterrorism and counterproliferation. Former head of the U.S. Air Force Intelligence, one of my favorite quotes, a Major General George Keegan said that in the Middle East, the Israeli intelligence, the Mossad, is worth about five CIAs. Israel and the United States also ex cooperate extensively in homeland security. Um, several months ago, I was honored to accompany the Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, uh, to Israel. Um, our systems, together, we help protect American ports, uh, American terminals from terrorist, from terrorist attacks. We are, we are countering unconventional weaponry. We, we are cooperating to a very large extent in cyber warfare, the newest and most dangerous field. And we're also combating the drug trade together. Israel not only uh, helps enhance uh, America's defenses, it also helps save American lives. There's a little kibbutz, a communal farm up in the northern Galilee. It's actually founded by a group of former Americans in the 1940s. That little kibbutz has provided armored kits for 20,000 American vehicles in Afghanistan and Iraq. Extraordinary. And uh, another Israeli startup company in our hometown of Jerusalem has developed a high-tech bandage that stops hemorrhaging very quickly. We have provided one million of these bandages uh, to American forces fighting. One of those bandages happened to be in the medical kit of the SWAT team in Tucson, Arizona, the day that Congresswoman uh, Gabby Giffords was shot. And they used that bandage, and that bandage was absolutely instrumental in saving Congressman Giffords' life. Now, Israel is not situated just anywhere. It just happens to be situated at the most strategically crucial crossroads in the world, at the, the nexus between Africa, Asia, Europe. And that is an area, it's a junction of, of just paramount American strategic interests. Israel, at that juncture, has an army that is larger than the French and British armies combined. Israel's presence as a military power there has enabled the United States military to minimize its presence in the Eastern Mediterranean as opposed to the Persian Gulf. Secretary of State Alexander Haig said 30 years ago, and I think it holds true today, and I quote, Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier in the world that cannot be sunk, does not carry even one American soldier, and is located in a critical region for American national security. Now, in case all of that is not sufficient, the United States and Israel cooperate on a broad range of fields, not just the military. Close coordination between the United States and Israel enabled Israeli medical teams to arrive first on the scene of the horrible earthquake in Haiti. In Haiti, they similarly assisted the victims of the Turkish and Indonesian quakes, as well as famines in Somalia, Mauritania, and in Kenya. Together, we run, we run development programs, including uh, educational development programs, uh, women empowerment and education programs in Africa, South America, and in Asia. Israel has also become a major commercial interest for the United States. This is the newest thing, thing I knew nothing about before I became ambassador, I assure you. Israel is America's 12th largest per capita export market in the world. Israel is America's 20th largest customer in the world. We surpass Argentina, uh, Russia, and Spain. Over the last decade, Americans have invested in Israel some $77 billion, and Israelis have invested in the United States over $50 billion. All of your major high-tech companies, Google, Microsoft, Microsoft, IBM, Intel, Motorola, all of them have their R&D uh, centers in Israel. All of your computers work with Israeli uh, components. Most of your cell phones work with Israeli components. If you have USB flash drives, and I'm sure all of you use USB flash drives, it's an Israeli invention. After the United States and China, Israel is the most represented company in the NASDAQ exchange, most of the country on the NASDAQ exchange. And through Better Place, I don't know if you've heard of Better Place, it's an electric car operation. It aspires to create a complete nationwide affordable electric car system. Um, it is going into effect now in Israel. Israel will become a laboratory for electric cars. And through the Better Place program, we hope to be able to help fulfill uh, President Obama's pledge to put one million electric vehicles on American roads by 2015. 
And at a time when American corporations are outsourcing to India and China, Israel is outsourcing to the United States of America. Tens of thousands of Americans are employed in Israeli companies in this country. I don't know if this is a good statistic or a bad statistic. One out of every six pills that you take, I hope you don't take them, is made by Teva. Teva, an Israeli pharmaceutical company, again, has plants across the United States. Now, does this mean we agree on everything? Um, those of you who study history know that allies often do not agree on everything. If you studied the British-American alliance during World War II, one of the most storied alliances in history, they disagreed on an awful lot during World War II. Now, the press likes focusing on some of our differences, particularly the differences relating to the tactics in the peace process. Um, questions of Israeli settlements, Israeli uh, policies in Jerusalem. I'm sure you'll have questions about it later, and I'll be happy to answer them. But I understand that these are tactical differences. We agree on far more than we disagree on the tactics. We agree that there's no alternative to direct talks between Israel and the Palestinians. We agree that those talks have to address all of the core issues, including Jerusalem, including the future of the settlements, but also the future of Palestinian refugees, uh, security arrangements. Those are the tactics. And we agree first, for, for, for we, the, the, our agreements far overshadow our disagreements. But more importantly, we agree on the end of the peace process. And that is the peace process should culminate in a two-state solution, a Jewish state of Israel living side by side in a permanent and secure relationship with a Palestinian homeland, the Palestinian state. And that will be the basis of what we hope to be a regional peace uh, for the entire Middle East. As President Obama has said, America has no better friend in the world than the state of Israel. And that friendship will only continue to blossom. I don't have to tell you, and I think that uh, Dr. Lutus alluded to this as well, I don't have to tell you that the Middle East is a very uncertain place these days. The situation there is highly fluid. It can be highly flammable as well. But some things are certain. There is one country in the Middle East that will remain categorically democratic, it will remain stable, it will remain militarily, technologically, and economically robust, and it will remain unequivocally pro-American. No American flags being burnt in the state of Israel, friends. And whether you pursue a career here at Salva Regina in uh, international affairs, or you remain serving your country in uniform, either way, I believe you'll come to value this relationship and it's a relationship that is cherished by the overwhelming majority of Americans. Simply put, Israel is not only a trusted friend of the United States, it's not only an ally, but in our world today, Israel is America's ultimate ally. Thank you. I'd be delighted to accept any question, please.